we continue in Sefer Agada in page 110, the description of the forefathers coming and uh, trying to defend Am Israel after the destruction of the temple. And the, the people who come and talk to, to God are Abraham, Yitzhak, Yaakov, and Moshe. And here is what Abraham says. Patah Abraham lifnei HaKadosh Baruch Hu ve'amar, ribono shal olam, למאה שנה נתת לי בן, כשעמד על דעתו והיה בחור בן שלושים ושבע שנים, אמרת לי העלה הוא עולה לפניי. He says, you gave me a son when I was a hundred years old, and when he turned thirty-seven, already a grown man, you told me to bring him as a sacrifice. This is of course based on another midrash that says that Yitzhak was thirty-seven years old. We spoke about it previously. Yitzhak was not thirty-seven. He was probably a young kid, somewhere between six and, and twelve. But anyway, this is how the Midrash sees it. And Midrash says, V'na'aseti alav ki akhzari, v'lo rechamtai alav, ela ani ba'atzmi kafati oto, v'lo tizkor li zot, v'lo terachib al banai. Abraham says, a very strong language, says, I became, I showed cruelty towards my son because of your commandment, meaning I was willing to do everything that you asked me to do. So you should, you should uh, consider that a great merit, and in, uh, in that merit, Forgive my children. God doesn't answer. There's no answer here. So God remains quiet. It's Haq now talks. Ribbono shal olam. Kshamar li Abba, Elohim yireh lo ase lo ola beni. Lo aikavti al devarecha. It's Haq says, according to the Midrash, when my father told me, when I asked my father, where is the lamb? And my father said, God will choose the lamb. I already knew that I'm the lamb, that I'm the sacrifice. And... I did not protest, I did not argue. Not only I let my father bind me, again, according to this interpretation that Yitzhak was an older man, which he was not, but I let my father bind me and I uh, extended or stretched my neck so he could uh, slaughter me with ease. He says, this is a great merit in which merit you have to forgive my children. God doesn't answer. פתח יעקב ואמר, ריבונו של עולם, לא עשרים שנה עמדתי בבית לבן? יעקב says, didn't I work for 20 years in the house of לבן? וכשיצאתי מביתו, פגע בי עשב הרשע וביקש להרוג בניי ומסרתי עצמי למיטה עליהם, and when I left his house, I saw attempted to kill me and I was willing to sacrifice my life for them. This is all based on Midrashic interpretation because it's not in the text of the Torah. ועכשיו נמסרו ביד אויביהם כצאן לטבחה. And now here they're going, they're handed over to their enemies like, uh, like sheep let, being led to the, to the slaughterhouse. I raised them like one takes care of little chicks until they grow up to become roosters. And I suffered for them. Of course, the suffering of Yaakov that we know in the parashot that we read now through the book of uh, Vayeshev, Miketz, Vayigash, how much Yaakov suffered because of the sibling rivalry between his children. So Yaakov said, I went through all this for what uh, purpose, to what end? To raise the people who are going to eventually become the 12 tribes, the founders of Am Yisrael. Again, he says, in that marriage, you have to have mercy on my children. God doesn't answer. Now Moshe speaks. ריבונו של עולם, לא רועי נאמן הייתי על ישראל ארבעים שנה? Wasn't I a faithful shepherd for Am Yisrael for 40 years in the desert? ורצתי לפניהם כסוס במדבר. He says, I was like a horse, and a work horse, it was the horse that leads the way ahead of the camp in the desert. וכשהגיע הזמן שייכנסו לארץ, גזרת עליי במדבר יפלו עצמותיי, but when the time came for them to go into ארץ ישראל, you decreed that I will not enter ארץ ישראל. And that I will be buried in the desert. Actually, in the language of the Midrash, it's a little harsh. It says that my bones will be scattered in the desert. Now Moshe comes from a different angle. This is based on the, on the Midrash. That it was God himself who summoned, who told Yirmiyahu, go and summon for me. Abraham, Yitzhak, Yaakov, Moshe, let them plead with me. So Moshe says, now you call me? It's like now, now that now that you're in trouble, you're calling me to to plead for them. Zeo shamru zeo amasha shomrim bnei adam mituv adoni lo tovli umeraato raali. This is a big complaint of Moshe. Moshe is not in the same uh, mentality 
of Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, whereas Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov list their merits, and they say, in my merit, forgive my children, Moshe says, you're not fair to me. You, when you had a good time, I didn't enjoy it. But now that you're suffering, I have to suffer with you. But this is only rhetoric, because we know that Moshe is a, is a master of, uh, of uh, delivering arguing, his point, arguing with, God. arguing with God and convincing God. So this is how Moshe tries to give you a hold, to convince God, to listen to him. And then he says to Yirmiya, let us go <coughs> and see what happens to the, uh, to the exiles. Yirmiya says, you can't walk, the, the roads are blocked, the roads are blocked because of the, of the bodies of the people that were killed. He says, let us go anyway. And they go, and they come to Naharot Bavel. Al Naharot Bavel, Sham Yasham Lugam Bachin, you know, the under by the rivers of Babylon, where we sit down and cry. This is the famous uh, Mizmo. Uh, and the people see Moshe, and they say, he came to redeem us. And he says, I'm sorry, I cannot redeem you. Not, the time did not come yet, but I pray to God that he will bring you back. And then he left them, and they started crying, and that is the Pasuk, Al Naharot Bavel, Sham Yasham Lugam Bachin, the, from Tehillim 137. So, you know, the Midrash is trying to convey the idea that Bnei Israel, when they went in exile, most probably were thinking of how they got to this situation and they were thinking of Moshe, the Redeemer, and they were saying to themselves, we wish that we had someone like him who will get us out of the situation and bring us back to Eretz Israel. <coughs> and then Moshe comes back and, and delivers the, uh, the news so Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov telling them how the uh, exiles are being tortured, how they suffer, and Moshe starts a lamentation, a eulogy, but nothing, have, nothing helps. Moshe is, is mourning the, the, the Israelites, he curses the sun that keeps rising, all that gets no reaction from God. There's no response from God. With all this Argument and finally Moshe says, "Rebono shel olam, katavta betoratecha v'shor ese ose oto ve'et beno lo tishhatu b'yom echad v'alok v'aragu banim v'imotem kama v'chama v'ata shotek." This obviously this is not Moshe Rabbeinu speaking. This is the author of the midrash. Just shows you like how much pain people felt over the destruction that the rabbi whoever wrote that midrash is accusing God. He says, "How can you?" Tell us in the Torah not to slaughter a cow and its calf on the same day, <coughs> obviously to show mercy. So he accuses God, you pretend to be merciful, but you're not, because you allowed for children and their mothers to be killed on the same day. So it's of course a, uh, a hyperbole, because even for the children to be killed alone, or for the mothers to be killed alone, is a cruel thing. But here's to say... Uh, at least don't let them be killed on the same day because this is what you wrote in the Torah. So this is a strong accusation telling God that he is not following the, his own orders, right? This is an amazing statement that you know, when sometimes it's lost, when you read the Midrash, you say, oh, well, this is what Moshe said. Moshe didn't say that. The author of the Midrash about 1800 years ago wrote that. But then the Midrash changes course. Be'ota sha'ar, the, the, the term for Rahel, Rahel now joins the conversation, but she doesn't join like all the others. Patah Moshe ve'amar, Patah ve'amar. Like it, it's almost like they're all standing in, in line. Each one you take a number, okay, your turn to speak. What do you have to say? Then you move aside. Rejected, no objection. But the Rahel Kafza, she to jump is the, has two, uh, two meanings here. One is that she speaks out of turn, or without permission, nobody oh, asks her, right, she calls out, nobody asks her to talk, nobody uh, gave her permission, maybe she's not even supposed to talk at all, not just out of line, that's one. The other thing is, likpots connotes motion, a, uh, a movement. So all the others, the men are described as standing still, except for Moshe, who goes to see what is happening, but still, it's a, it's a more... Uh, quiet, calm movement, or completely being passive. But Rahel is agitated. And that is the part of the Midrash where you see that the author tells us there's a difference with the way men handle uh, 
the events and women and the events. Rahel is much more emotional and agitated and she's doing something about it. Mm-hmm. They like we say like a wounded lioness or a, a mother who protects her children. You, that you don't want to really, you know, uh, as they say, to mess with them. A woman can have uh, tremendous powers when she gets to that point. And she now jumps out of line and she confronts God. What does she say? You know that Yaakov loved me tremendously and worked for me for seven years. And when the time came for me to get married to Yaakov, my father cheated him and planned to put Leah in my stead. And that is based on another midrash that uh, Rachel and Yaakov said a secret language between them, a code, to know whether it's Rachel or not. But the last minute before the Chupa, Leah, Rachel did not want to embarrass her sister, so she gave her the, the, these codes, Passwords. those passwords, so she wouldn't be embarrassed. So now, what would Rachel say now? If she would follow the line of thought of the men, she would say, in that merit, you should have mercy on my children, Right? She doesn't say that. What does she say? She says, Uma imani shani basar vedam afar vaefer lo kineti betzara sheli. She says, I, I'm a human being, flesh and blood, dust and ashes. Like I'm worthless. Lo kineti betzara sheli. And I was not jealous of my adversary. And I had all the right, I mean, it's basar vadam, meaning we, have, we are arrogant, we have, uh, we have our desires and our negative uh, uh, character traits. It says, with all that, Rahel says, I was not jealous of my tzara, of Leah, which was a real threat. She's a real woman, she's the sister, she ended up having more children, for, bearing more children for Yaakov, and Rahel was jealous of her, eventually. But she says, Ata melech hai vekaya verahman, you are an eternal king. <coughs> How can you be jealous of idolatry and because of that send my, <coughs> my children in exile? And as a response to that argument, God says, I will bring them back. <coughs> and the Midrash calls the Pasuk, famous Pasuk. A voice is, uh, is heard loudly on the Rama, on the, on the, uh, play, on the uh, plateau. It's like a high, heightened level over the hilltops. Uh, the wailing sound of the cries of Rachel, who is mourning her children and refuses to be comforted. God says, stop crying, stop uh, wailing, you will be rewarded, and they will return to their, uh, to their place. This is in Yirmiyahu, Yirmiyahu uh, chapter 31. Oh, so he, because Yirmiyahu is the prophet of the destruction, so it is... But it's, it's really interesting, that's a different question, why Yirmiyahu focuses on Rachel... Uh, probably because he sees that uh, Yirmiyahu was very connected to the people as much as he rebuked them but he really felt for them strong emotions and he had to convey them through the image of a mother crying for the children that's how he, see, uh, he sees it also if you look at Echa uh, the book of Lamentations that was also written by Yirmiyahu you see that he uses the constantly speaks about the, what happens to the mothers and the children Yedei Nashim Rahmaniot it's a ter- terrible situation. <coughs> it's interesting that, you know, as we return to Eretz Israel, that became, you know, there are many songs about that, Re'i Rachel Re'i, Re'i Ribbon Olam, Re'i Rachel Re'i, Epshav Uli Gvulam, it's a beautiful song. Yoram Gaon sings, Re'i Rachel Re'i, Re'i Ribbon Olam, Re'i Rachel Re'i, Epshav Uli Gvulam. And also the kibbutz that is built right outside Yerushalayim called Ramat Rachel, to commemorize that Kol Be'Rama Nishma. Right, what? It's now it's in Yerushalayim. Like, when I was a kid, it was outside Yerushalayim. I think uh, Kav Sheva, <coughs> bus number seven, would take you. Like, it was the end of the world, on the way to Bethlehem. Um, but in, the interesting thing about this whole uh, discussion here is that the author of the Midrash, uh, it's a complete paradigm shift between the men and the women. The men all come demanding reward. I did A, B, C, 
I, have a, I, I deserve a reward. God doesn't answer. Either he doesn't acknowledge the merit, or he says, yeah, you deserve a reward, but that's not it, goodbye, I'm not going to talk to you. Rahel comes from a different angle altogether. She doesn't say, I deserve it. She says, learn from me. This is another audacious move of the, of the, of the author. Rahel is telling God, you should learn from me. If I, as a human being, was able to overcome my jealousy and give room for my sister, let her live alongside um, myself, and, and of course, it did not happen in the Tanakh. So this is the, this is the author of Midrash talking. He says, we humans are able to forgive each other, even in the case of jealousy. You, God, why are you jealous of idolatry? It has no meaning. It has no value. It's, he's basically challenging the whole concept of Avodah Zarah in the Tanakh, saying that, okay, we understand that God doesn't like Avodah Zarah, but if we did it, He has to forgive us, because He realizes that there's no value, there's no uh, uh, real essence in Avodah Zarah. So this is a challenge to, to God on that, on that point. But also, uh, on a different level, it shows that understanding the, the author of the Midrash really understood the nature of women, or maybe, the, maybe whoever wrote that Midrash was a woman that understands that men and women have different ways, a different way to handle uh, conflicts. The man comes and says, this is, the, this is the process. I put this in, this is my input, I deserve my output. The woman comes and says, we have to, we have to understand each other, L- look at my actions. She, more, she is more of an educator. She wants people to sympathize and empathize, and then she will get things done. So with that, I think we end the Midrashim on the Hurban. Bukhadunai, li'ulam, amen, ve'amen.